Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, colorectal carcinoma, where we are discussing the Vogelstein model for colon cancer. Okay, so um, so far we haven't even got past the first stage of the Vogelstein model, but that's okay because I want to explain uh, the pathways involved in this in detail as well, so that we can. Uh, I want the video to stand alone, basically. I don't want you to have had to watch my other videos to understand it. Okay, um, so uh, the disheveled. Um, protein, it, when it's activated by Wnt binding to the frizzled receptor and also this LRP4-5 receptor, um, that's going to um, inactivate the beta-catenin destruction complex, and when the beta-catenin destruction complex is inactivated, beta-catenin levels within the cytoplasm of the cell are going to go up. Beta-catenin is then a what's known as a transcriptional coactivator. So where should I write that? Transcriptional coactivator. And what that means is it's not a transcription factor in its own right. Instead, what it does is it binds to transcription factors and alters uh, the function of those transcription factors. So, basically, if this is the nucleus of the cell, let's say here, I'll explain firstly what a transcription factor is, give examples of transcription factors, and then I'll show you how beta-catenin, a transcriptional coactivator, is going to alter the function of those transcription factors. Okay, so basically, in eukaryotic cells, uh, upstream of all genes, you have what is known as a promoter region, basically. This isn't the case in prokaryotes, but in eukaryotes it is. Basically, in front of all genes, so let's say this is a gene here, and we'll highlight it in green, I think. So this is a gene, okay? In front of all genes, or upstream of all genes, is uh, the technical term. Uh, there is what is known as a promoter region. So let's call this bit here the promoter region. And we'll colour that in pink. So upstream of all genes, there is a promoter region. And the promoter region does not uh, actually code for protein. So it's the sequence of organic bases in this promoter region are not going to be used um, to make protein from. But the promoter region does affect the expression of this gene here, meaning how much of the gene product of this gene do we actually make. And the reason it does this, well, the reason it can do this, is because in order to make the gene product of this gene, what needs to happen is that RNA polymerase needs to come bind to the promoter region and make its way along this DNA and copy uh, the uh, DNA onto a um, complementary piece of mRNA, basically. Okay, so in order to get that to happen, you need RNA polymerase to come and bind to this promoter region. So, if the promoter region has high affinity for uh, RNA polymerase, then RNA polymerase will bind here more often, and you'll get more mRNA being produced, and therefore, if you get more mRNA, you'll get more protein, you'll get more of the gene product produced. Okay? Whereas, if it's got a low affinity for RNA polymerase, you'll get less RNA polymerase binding here, less uh, transcription of the gene, and therefore less protein produced. So, uh, the affinity of the promoter region for RNA polymerase controls the expression of this gene, basically, and how much gene product you actually produce. So, a transcription factor is some molecule which binds to the promoter region, here, uh, I'll do it in uh, red, and is going to alter um, the affinity of that promoter region for uh, RNA polymerase, basically. And transcription factors can both increase the affinity or decrease the affinity. I, if they increase the affinity, they are promoting the expression of the gene. And if they decrease the affinity, they are going to repress the expression of the gene. So this is a transcription factor. So transcription factors, thereby, are going to alter the expression of certain genes within um, the human genome, basically, and within that cell. So they're very important, therefore, and can cause a lot of um, a lot of downstream effects. Now, a transcriptional coactivator, which is what beta catenin is, is something which can alter, well, which combines to a transcription factor, like so.
and alter which promoter regions the um, transcriptional, uh, sorry, the transcription factor is going to bind to, basically. And also, it can also alter uh, how it's how that transcription factor is going to affect those promoter regions, i.e., whether it's going to promote the expression of the gene or repress the um, the um, expression of the gene. So basically, transcriptional co-activators bind to transcription factors and alter their function, basically. Transcriptional co-activators. But they themselves, without the transcription factor, they cannot bind to the DNA, basically. Transcriptional co-activator. Right, so beta catenin is what's known as a transcriptional co-activator. So you might now wonder, well, which transcription factors does it bind to? Well, it can bind to two transcription factors, well, two families of transcription factors. Namely, it can bind to T-cell factors, which are a type of transcription factors, usually abbreviated to TCFs, okay? And it can also bind to uh, lymphoid enhancer factors. So, lymphoid enhancer factors, usually abbreviated to LEFs, lymphoid enhancer factors. Uh, slash um, LEFs. Okay, and basically, when beta catenin binds to these transcription factors, these TCFs or these LEFs, uh, what it does is it alters their function, and now what's going to happen is those transcription factors with beta catenin bound are going to uh, make, uh, going to increase the expression of genes which are necessary to begin the process of growth, basically. So, what this is overall going to do is it's going to promote the cell dividing. So this is going to promote the cell cycle. So it's going to make the cell divide more rapidly. So division is going to go up. So that's overall what WINT does. Now, I didn't say that we were going to have a, a mutation in WINT. I said we were going to have a mutation in adenomatous polyposis coli. Now, if we lost our fun all the function of this adenomatous polyposis coli here, what would happen? Well, you wouldn't be able to make any functional uh, beta-catenin destruction complexes anymore. Beta-catenin would therefore not be phosphorylated and not be ubiquitinated and not be destroyed. So beta-catenin would go up within the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, Beta-catenin would then bind to its T-cell factors and its lymphoid enhancer factors and increase uh, the uh, expression of genes which are going to move you from the interphase of the cell cycle to the G1 phase. So let me just give you a brief reminder of the phases of the cell cycle. So a brief... Oh, actually, we're not got, we haven't got room down here. We'll have to go on to the next page. So briefly then... Um, interphase of the cell cycle is the portion where a cell is not actually dividing. So it's not an active portion of the cell cycle. It's the portion where your colonic epithelial cell is perfectly happy, basically, and not dividing. Then, when it receives growth stimulatory, um, stimulatory stimuli, such as WINT, uh, what happens is it moves into the G1 phase, or the first growth phase of the cell cycle. And in the first growth phase, what is happening is it starts getting ready to divide. So it produces a lot of the proteins associated with uh, replication of the genome. Uh, and also, it starts to produce uh, a lot of duplicate proteins that are essential for the cell's metabolism. So if you think about it, if we're going to go from being one cell to being two cells, then you're going to have to increase the amount of protein you have uh, by two, because uh, you're going to have to have enough protein for both of the two daughter cells. So uh, the uh, duplication of the essential proteins for life is going to also happen in G1 phase. So you make a lot of proteins in G1 phase. You make proteins that are going to be needed by both of the daughter cells, and you also make the necessary machinery for uh, replicating the genome. The next phase is what's known as S phase of the cell cycle. And in this phase, what happens is the genome is actually replicated. So all the DNA within the cell divides. Okay, oh, well, um, it's replicated. Then the next phase after that is what's known as G2 phase, or the second growth phase. And in this phase, what happens is um, you make more of the proteins, you 
that you're going to need for the two daughter cells. So you get you continue with the work of G1 phase where you were duplicating these um, uh, necessary proteins. And also, you're going to uh, start getting ready for the M phase of the cell cycle, in which you're going to split the nucleus firstly, and then split the cell. And in order to do those processes, you're going to need a lot of proteins, and those proteins will be made in G2 phase. Then the final phase of the cell cycle is the M phase, uh, which is the phase where... Firstly, the nucleus divides in two, because previously, when you just copied the DNA, what you had, effectively, was you had one nucleus with double the amount of DNA in. So all of the chromosomes, all 46 chromosomes have been copied, so you've got a copy of every single chromosome, uh, well, two copies of every single chromosome, basically. So, what now needs to happen is, firstly, a process known as mitosis happens in M phase, and mitosis strictly means the division of the nucleus into two to produce two identical nuclei. Although people will use mitosis to refer to the whole division of the cell to produce two genetically identical daughter cells. Okay, and each of these nuclei will have a uh, wand copy of each of the 46 chromosomes. Okay, and then finally, the last phase of uh, the end phase of the cell cycle is a process known as cytokinesis, which is basically where the cell is going to actually divide into two daughter cells. Okay, like so. Right, and each of those daughter cells will have a single copy of each chromosome. So that's the process of cytokinesis. And what colour should we do end phase in? And I've now run out of colours. Uh, my blue pen has failed on me, so I no longer have enough colours for all those six different phases. So we'll have to have that in green again. Okay, uh, right. So, uh, the activation of um, the Wnt pathway basically moves you from interphase to G1 phase, i.e. it starts the cell cycle, it kick-starts the cell cycle, and it's going to make the cell divide into two. Right. Okay, so we were thinking about what would happen if we had loss of function of APC. Well, it's going to cause uh, a rise in the level of beta-catenin, and then it's going to cause you to start you to move from this interphase to G1 phase, which is what uh, beta-catenin bound to its T-cell factors or lymphoid enhancer factors are going to do. So it's going to basically cause the cell to over-divide, basically. Okay, uh, so... Well, how do we get complete loss of APC? Well, we'll talk about that in the next video.